What's up guys, it's Dollmatter here, and today we're going to be reacting to a new channel. This is Yurik Inc., I believe it's how you pronounce it. Uh, and this is another history video, so new new history channel for us to watch, I guess. Uh, this is the Five Kingdoms of Italy Explained, Illustrated Summary. Now, I'm not sure if this is going to be talking about when Italy was all split apart, or if it's going to be talking about like the major kingdoms throughout Italian history, like the Lombards and the... Uh, Oh, uh, Oduacker's Kingdom, I can't remember what that one was called. Um, then you had the Lombards, you had uh, Italy Savoy, you had the Napoleonic Kingdom. Um, I guess the Kingdom of Two Sicilies could be thrown up there. Uh, I'm not sure. It, or it might just be talking about a, a period where they were split into the five kingdoms, kind of like the Heptarchy in England. Um, but anyway, I guess we'll find out. So link to the original video down below. Let's jump into it. Throughout hi oh. history, there have been multiple... Okay, first off, the... the uh, the aesthetic reminds me of like an anime YouTuber, like somebody that would do anime or Pokemon videos. States called or referred as the Kingdom of Italy, though usually most people tend to refer to the kingdom ruled by the House of Savoy. You know, the one with uh, the Count of Cavour and Garibaldi. So to clarify, this video isn't about the many Italian kingdoms. No, no, no. This video is about the five kingdoms of Italy, or six depending on who you ask. Okay, so yeah, this is about... Um different kingdoms that actually more or less unified Italy over time. And explain their differences, how they came to be, and how they ended. We begin in the 5th century, where the Roman Empire was politically divided into western and eastern sections, with the former's capital located in Ravenna. The west was ruled by a man named Julius Nepos, but by 475, a military leader named Orestes kicked him out of power and installed his son named Romulus Augustus as Emperor of the West. Though the Eastern Roman Emperor Zeno considered the two of them as usurpers. Around the same time, a military federati leader named Odoacer used this as an opportunity to come to power. In 476, after killing Orestes and exiling the young Emperor to Naples, Odoacer basically turned around to Zeno and said, I've deposed the usurpers and restored order in your behalf, your majesty. And Zeno was like, I don't even know who you are, but good job. So are you gonna bring back Nepos to power? Hmm, maybe. Yeah, so I, this is one of the things I find most interesting when it comes to like the perspective of history versus the reality of history. Um, the Historian's Craft has a great video on this that we actually reacted to a while ago, uh, where he talks about how at this point in history, it, it was very much seen by both Odoacer and the the Eastern Roman Empire, the Byzantine Empire, the Roman Empire, whatever you want to call it, that Odoacer was part of the Roman Empire. They were essentially a, uh, a semi-autonomous zone within the empire, I guess is the best way to put it. But he, he saw himself as subservient to the empire. Like, he didn't see himself as, like, some other kingdom. Uh, it wasn't until, I believe it was Justinian, uh, where he basically had like this retconned version of history in order to justify pushing in there uh, to basically reestablish a, you know, the the empire in its former glory as he saw it, uh, which to some degree was true, right? He wanted to get rid of the the two emperor system, the co emperor system. He wanted to reestablish the former borders, right? At this point, you know, France had been ruled by the Franks. Uh, you know, Hispania uh, uh, had been lost for ever or I, like which is i guess the modern day iberian peninsula spain and portugal um you know the anglo-saxons had conquered england um but yeah he wanted to reconquer all that territory and part of his justification for that was essentially getting a retconned version of history passed and like memory holing the reality which worked to a large degree to the point where even to this day people talk about the fall of the west as if it happened you know during the G germanic invasions and then you know, up until Justinian basically reconquered parts of that, that, you know, that wasn't Roman Empire, but it was. Despite Odoacer nominally recognizing Nepos' authority, he practically ruled over Italy on his own. Most historians typically consider the deposition of Romulus as the end of the Roman Empire, or at least the western part. Usually Odoacer's rule over Italy is considered its own kingdom, therefore making this the first kingdom of Italy. I personally am a bit hesitant to count it, since or yeah, uh, uh, me as well, because it's much more like an autonomous zone within the Roman Empire, right? Because he considered himself part of the Roman Empire, the Roman Empire considered him part of the Roman Empire, and it wasn't until, you know, retconned history a couple hundred years later that it was, you know, 
retconned. Um, everyone there can, like, you know, the guy in charge considered himself Roman. Uh, he considered himself part of the Roman Empire. The leader of the Roman Empire considered him part of the Roman Empire. The people considered themselves Romans, right? It, it's kind of weird to look back and be like, yeah, no, no. Every, everyone that was alive at this time, the de facto and the de jure of the time, all wrong. Because we, we have, like, modern notions of, like, East versus West that we want to, you know, hyperimpose on uh, history that was not the reality at the time. Overall, Odoacre didn't make any sweeping changes in Italy, he ruled with the support of the Senate and was recognized as Duke by Zeno, and never properly split off from the Empire. The problem is that Odoacre started being called Rex, or King, by his followers, something that Zeno didn't like. Plus, he still wanted to put Nepos back into power until Nepos was assassinated in 480, which weirdly enough, as far as we know, had nothing to do with Odoacre. So the Eastern Roman Emperor, or, or just the Roman Emperor, invited the Ostrogothic King Theodoric to take over Italy. After a brief battle, the Ostrogoths took over Italy, thus establishing the first kingdom of Italy, also known as the Ostrogothic Kingdom, or as I like to call it, Italy's Goth phase. <laughs> Despite being this, and again, still technically part of the Roman Empire, it's hard to declare this a kingdom unless you mean like a kingdom within an empire, which I guess you could have, right? Because um, that that's not unknown, right? Like, just look at the the Holy Roman Empire. There are multiple kingdoms within the Holy Roman Empire, so I guess you could kind of count this one. Being a Goth, Theodoric, much like his predecessor, ruled like a Roman emperor in everything but name. He ruled over Italy as a viceroy, who nominally ruled in behalf of the emperor in Constantinople. Though this arrangement was far more official compared to the one with Odoacre. The people in Italy were still considered Romans and continued to be ruled through Roman laws, while the Goths ruled themselves with their own laws. Theodoric presented himself as king of the Goths and Romans and ruled with the support of the Senate. Though as time passed, relations between the Ostrogoths and Byzantines worsened, until by 554 they retook Italy, and that's Kingdom of Italy won down. Though Byzantine rule over Italy was short-lived, since because of the Gothic War and Plague, Italy suffered a massive loss in population, which allowed another group of Germanic people, called the Lombards, to take over two-thirds of Italy. Yeah, this is the first one I think you can consider the like the actual like nail in the coffin for the West, in my opinion. I know it's a lot later than it's like generally agreed upon by historians, but it's it, it, it's it's much more accurate to the way that people actually saw things at the time, and much more rea accurate to the the reality of the situation. Again, like if you haven't seen it, check out historians craft historian crafts video on this. Uh, we did a reaction to it. I can't remember the name of the video, uh, but he does a great video talking about like the reality versus the retconned version of history that Justinian got passed, and then how the West picked up on that in order to kind of divide East from West, uh, and then you know try to reclaim that glory of the former. So much of it has to do with like so much like. It's honestly such a fascinating video, definitely go check it out. By 603, the king of the Lombards fashioned himself as king of all of Italy. Though if you were to look at a map around this time, you soon realize that the title is a bit misleading. The Lombard kingdom was composed of two major parts, Langobardia Maior and Langobarda Minor. The north was made up of multiple smaller duchies, while the south was composed of two large ones. The rest of Italy was ruled by the Byzantines. The Lombards had a mixed relationship with the papacy, since the Lombard nobility was a mix of Catholic Christians, Aryan Christians and even pagans, who ruled over a majority Catholic population. Throughout its existence, the kings would struggle to assert their control over the dukes and the rest of the nobility, especially in the south where they were basically de facto independent. As time passed, the Lombards became more and more Latinized, despite the pagan and Aryan nobility wanting to preserve their own Lombard identity and warlike culture. In the end, much like other post-Western Roman Empire collapsed kingdoms, by around the 8th century they became predominantly Latin-speaking Catholics, and the people that lived within the kingdom stopped being referred as Romans and were simply referred as Lombards. Despite all of that, they still really wanted to conquer- It's interesting how you have that fusion, right? You, you see this in France, too, um, where, you know, they, these people refer to themselves as Lombards, which is the name of the Germanic tribe that conquered them, but they speak the language and follow the religion of the Latin people they conquered. And you see this in France as well, right? France obviously gets its name from the Franks, which was a tribe that conquered the area. But they speak a Latin-based language and, you know, they're Catholic. They're not, you know, they don't follow Arianism, uh, which was, you know, kind of the, 
Germanic version of Christianity pre-Protestantism um, that was largely wiped out. I, I, there might still be some pockets today, but it's not really a thing as far as I understand. Um, but uh, and they don't follow Germanic paganism, right? And then you, then you have a situation like uh, um, England, where you know, or Britain, I should say, where they, you know, England is gets its name from the Angles. So that's a little bit different, but Britain is named after you know the the Latin name for the country, despite the fact that they speak you know English, which is a Germanic language, and they did follow Catholicism. Although now the official state religion is Anglicanism. Although you know, it's, it, Britain's a weird country. Conquer Rome, especially after they had conquered Ravenna in 751. The Pope called the Franks for help, who quickly defeated the Lombards and gave the Pope some of the land that was recently conquered by the Lombards as a donation, thus officially establishing the Papal States. And a few years later, the Lombards again threatened the papacy and again the Franks intervened. But this time, they captured Pavia, conquering the kingdom. Well, except for Benevento, which continued to be its own thing, but whatever. Thus, Kingdom of Italy too is over. In 773, Northern Italy became part of the Carolingian Empire. But after the death of Charlemagne and his son, the kingdom was divided, because Salian law be like that, and by the mid 9th century, the Kingdom of Italy, also known Yeah, so Salian law, which is, I guess, technically a branch of Germanic tribal law, if I'm not mistaken. Um, Germanic tribal law, essentially, if you have multiple sons, your land gets divided between your sons. This is why the HRE was such a disgusting mess, is because what would happen is uh, you would have, you know, you have this giant chunk of land that you, you know, fought and you conquered, but then you have eight sons and then it divides it between them. And then, you know, maybe they'll fight each other, they'll fight other people, but then, you know, eventually they die and they have 12 sons and then it, that gets divided between them. And then you get to this place where, you know, you have the Holy Roman Empire, the HRE, but then you have like a bajillion different little duchies and counties and kingdoms and, uh, you know, all this different mess within it. And so much of that was because of this old Germanic tribal law system, which divided the land equally amongst the sons, uh, which I guess to some degree still exists, right, with inheritance. Generally, inheritance is uh, divided between – now it's mostly children, right? It's not male preference, but um, – you still have this to some degree, but usually you don't divide land. Like if a farmer has, you know, a hundred acre farm, most of the time, you know, he has a hundred acre farm and he has five kids. It's not going to be 20 acres each. It'll one kid will inherit the farm and he'll either give the other kids money or they'll sell the farm and everyone will split the money. Um, Known as Imperial Italy was ruled by members of the Carolingian dynasty all the way until the death of Charles V in 887, imagine in which a series of fat. nobles claimed the title of King of Italy, which as you can imagine made it very unstable. This came to an end when the King of East Francia took over Italy for himself, but the year 961 Otto became King of Italy and was later crowned Holy Roman Emperor. East Francia and Italy became the two constituent realms of what would later become known as the Holy Roman Empire. But the Holy Roman Empire was the Holy Roman Empire. Because yeah. the Emperor was always in Germany and having to pull Hannibal just to tell those Italians to get back in line was more trouble than it was worth, the Kingdom of Italy fragmented into multiple independent city-states, which is how Renaissance Italy took shape. That's not to say the HRE didn't get involved in Italy. In fact, for some centuries, Habsburg, Austria, Spain and France would compete for control over the many states in Italy, basically turning the peninsula into their own personal playground. <laughs> this came to an end until the French Revolutionary Wars. Imperial Italy came to an end when Napoleon defeated and kicked out the Austrians. So that's kingdom number three down, and replaced it with a bunch of French puppet republics, who by 1805 were reorganized into the Kingdom of Italy, which is again just the north, and with Napoleon as its first king. In reality, it was ruled by Napoleon's stepson, Eugene, who ruled as viceroy. The Napoleonic Kingdom of Italy saw the continuation of the usage of the Napoleonic Code and establishing universal education for all children. After the deposition of Napoleon in 1814, Eugene surrendered to Austria and was exiled to Bavaria. The kingdom was later annexed by the Austrian Empire. However, as a side effect of Napoleon spreading the ideals of the French Revolution and the rise of romantic ideals of Italian nationalism, the idea of a united Italy became very popular, much to the dismay. You know the one thing I always find really interesting when it so with like certain nationalist movements, it, it, so nationalism in like the you know the 16th, 17th, 18th centuries, um, 
the the uh, like the ideas of nationalism was largely I guess what you would call like ethno nationalism, not in like the blood and soil sense of today, or at least not in like the hyper aggressive blood and soil sense that you think of today. But it was very much like you know we are a people, we deserve a nation. Let's break off from this empire and become our own nation, uh, or uh, you know unify our peoples or whatever it may be. I always when you look at like the you know the the Latin speaking countries of the time in in Europe. It was very much a language continuum. There wasn't, like, Italy didn't speak one unified Italian language. France didn't speak one unified French language. Um, Spain didn't speak one unified Spanish language. Now, to be fair, like, Spain and France already existed as essentially nation states for, you know, hundreds of years at this point. Um, But when it comes to Italy, I wonder why they tried to, you know, why specifically did they decide to unify around the concept of Italy? Because... If you're somebody in, like, northwestern Italy right on the border with France, you probably have more – an easier time understanding somebody right across the border who, you know, te- you know, maybe is technically considered speaking French or ox- – uh, what is it, Occidian? I can't remember the name of the language. I th- there's some other French. I think it's Occidian. Um, but you probably understand them much better than you would understand somebody in, like, southern Sicily, right? So I always wondered, like, how did the – uh, you know, the, the the idea for nationalism specifically arise with just the peninsula and not outside of the peninsula or not, you know, a smaller region or, you know, a Latin reunification of, you know, France and Spain and Portugal and all of these countries. Uh, it, that seems like really interesting to me, just considering like the, the, the reality of the language continuum of the time of the reinstalled monarchs. For the next decades, the peninsula would be plagued by revolutionary revolts. The Kingdom of Sardinia, along the help of the Italian revolutionary Giuseppe Garibaldi, took advantage of the instability to conquer and unify Italy. The House of Savoy would rule Italy all the way to World War II. After winning World War I and getting a participation prize, the Kingdom's <laughs> economy collapsed, which led to the rise of fringe political parties. In 1922, the fascist party marched onto Rome and convinced the king, Victor Emmanuel III, to appoint an ex-elementary school teacher as prime minister. As you know, Italy joined the Axis powers, but it turns out that losing a war and living under a military dictatorship sucks. So in 1943, Victor fired Mussolini and surrendered to the Allies. Italy fell into what was essentially a civil war, with the North being turned into a German puppet state and the South being led by a coalition of anti-fascist political parties and the King. Though at this point the King was sidelined from politics. After the war they held a referendum to decide to either keep the monarchy or turn into a republic. The Italian public had a very split opinion on the monarchy, since many believed the monarchy was partially to blame for the rise of the fascist party. In the end, Republican vote won, thus ending the kingdom of... Um, I don't know. I, I mean, yes and no. The, the thing is, like, you know, when you look at, like, these ideologies that were, you know, growing at the time, it was inevitable that one of them was going to take hold in a lot of these different countries. I'm honestly surprised a lot, like, some of them didn't take place in even more countries. Um, so, you know, maybe he didn't do the best job to curtail it, but it's, it was inevitable that one of them would rise to power, right? Italy and establishing the Republic of Italy in 1946. And that's how all the five or six kingdoms of Italy came to be and ended. This is one of those videos that you kind of watch while having dinner. It's not exactly a very educational. It's more for fun, really. Anyway, thanks for watching and uh, yeah, see you next time, whenever that is. I honestly thought he did a pretty good job from an educational perspective. Really, the only qualm I had, and even he said this is kind of a gray area, was when he was uh, talking about, like, Oduacker's kingdom and stuff like that, right? Um, again, like, watch the Historian Crafts video on this or watch my reaction to it, whichever you prefer. Uh, but the, you know, very much up until Justinian, both the people within Oduacker's kingdom and the official position of the Byzantine Eastern Roman Roman state was that this was part of the Roman Empire right it was kind of a semi-autonomous region type thing situation going on there Um, but you know it was very much historical revisionism by Justinian in order to justify getting rid of what he saw as a rival power within the empire uh, as the original you know reason for the spreading of the myth that this was not part of the Roman Empire, and then subsequently picked up 
in you know the Renaissance and afterwards by Westerners in order to you know di- kind of divide East and West and you know put West up on a pedestal and you know kind of like there's this kind of like romanticism of the past and stuff like that was very much you know popular during the uh, Renaissance era. Um, but yeah, this is largely a myth that it was not part of the Roman Empire. It was, but anyway, uh, very good channel, Uric Inc. Um, so link to the original video down below. Go check them out. Uh, let me know what you think below. Like, comment, subscribe. I'll see you guys in the next one.